I would like to welcome everybody who's come here. I'm really grateful for you guys for showing up, and I guess we're going to just start right into it. So, the panel, uh, the, my title panel is Et Lux in Tenebris Lucet, which, which translates from Latin, and the light shineth in the darkness. So, I'm actually going to go get my book really quick. I don't know if you can all see, this is a black book with one single candle wick right here. This is where I drew a lot of my inspiration from. And so, the cover of the book has a candle on it, just like um, one light can light up an entire black room. So, taking my two books into account, what does this light represent? So for my first book, um, written by Frederick Douglass, it was his education and his learning how to read that brought him to find his freedom. One specific quote he gives is it rekindled uh, the few expiring embers of freedom and inspired him again with a determination to be free. Um, one of the experiences that Frederick Douglass shares with us is um, that one of his slaveholders, um, named Mr. Covey, was well known as a slave breaker. They were there to break the slaves so they would only do the work that the masters asked them to do. But after a while, Frederick Douglass got very tired of that. He was upset that he was being treated the way he was, so he, just, he decided to fight back. And so, giving that quote, the um, learning how to read inspired him to fight back and be free again. He, early in his life, he suffered alongside many other slaves in darkness. He didn't start off his life learning how to read like many of us do. He didn't get to learn the alphabet or math or any of those subjects that we are very privileged to learn. So his education experience was a lot different from ours. He, um, one time he was transferred from one plantation to a different plantation and the mistress there decided to teach him how to read, not knowing that that's not what slaves were allowed to do. But that one experience proved to be the um, the, very, the turning point in his life as a slave. So, then for Frankel. Frankel was a Jew living in Germany during World War II, and so he actually had known freedom before being put into the concentration camps. He could tell the difference between his life in the camps versus his life when he was free. And he definitely understood the difference when he became free again after the camps were put away. And so another um, part for Frankel was that he was able to rediscover this hope in the concentration camps because he was able to overcome the cruelty and oppression and the apathy that was so prevalent there. And Frankel gives two pretty striking examples of men who um, who became apathetic, and who became uncaring of the beauty of the world. And this first one was um, a man who decided to, I guess, pickpocket um, a dead man's body and take all the things that were of worth to him, not caring that that man's body was dead and had no respect for it. The second example of that was a 12-year-old boy was sentenced to stand outside in the cold all day and Frankel being a doctor was asked to pick off the gangrenest toes that um, that had been frostbitten and he had to do that he had no feelings of pity for this boy until afterwards because um, just the oppression and the apathy in the camps were so I guess oppressive and so the lights for them, for Frederick Douglass, education, and for Frankel, the hope that he found within apathy. And so, um, what does this light mean for, Fred, uh, for Frederick Douglass, but for Frankel? It calls back to his title of his book, Man's Search for Meaning. So this light that we have found is meaning for people. So my definition of meaning, what I found from reading the books, 
is that meaning or purpose is what, gives pe what keeps people living actively, doing good actively, rather than passively waiting for men to um, wait and have every day pass by until, I mean, their life is over. So, with Frankel's book, he has a theory that men are made up of their choices rather than their situations. So some men in the camps, like I described before, gave in to this apathy and gave in to not having any meaning in their lives. And this destroys the sense of wonder that we all have. It destroys their ability to care for other people. It destroys their human empathy that's natural to us. <coughs> but people could find meaning even in the small things. One of um, one notable part of Frankel's book was that a man could find meaning even in having one cigarette left to smoke, which is pretty striking. Even just having one last thing to live for was enough to keep them going for another day. But this meaning can grow into other things like love and beauty and hope and freedom and friendship. <coughs> There's so many things that can give people meaning, but having some purpose or some drive to keep going is what's going to help us find beauty in the world. So, the more meaning we put in our lives, and the more purpose that we give ourselves, the more candles we get to light in the darkness. And one candle sure helps for that one man with a cigarette. That's good enough for him for that day. But with um, Frankel growing and growing and having more candles until um, we realize that what surrounds us is actually beautiful and there is still good even in the darkness, we just had to find a way to see it. And so, my last point is that we need to be the person to light our own candles. We can't expect other people to give us what we need. We should um, take it for ourselves. So, an example of that is with Douglas. <coughs> Learning how to read and write, Douglas was able to write a pass to his own freedom and um, I guess one of the further questions coming off of that, why didn't he write passes to more people's freedom? Douglas um, learned for himself through the education that he got from his um, slave masters. <coughs> Sorry. And um, he knew that not all the other slaves had had that same experience, that that was something pretty unique to him. And they needed to learn for themselves how to find freedom and not just expect it from others. So it's up to us to find our own meaning in our lives, and we can use that meaning to help us find hope in the future and to find healing from our past. And thank you for coming to my panel. <laughs> yeah, I need to drink water. <coughs> I don't hear. I wish I wasn't sick. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, Lauren. That was beautiful. Uh, I'd like to start by asking you, um, specifically from Frederick Douglass's text. Yes. Um, Douglass talks about his education leading to his freedom, and you brought that up several times. Um, and you brought up the example uh, that he writes himself passes to allow him to leave um, the, the plantation. Um, in what other senses is his education free? Or uh, how does his education lead to that freedom? Kind of what's happening in the middle between him learning to read and him getting to leave the plantation? Yes. Alrighty. Um. So, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> one thing I would like to bring up is actually another example from Douglas. Um, so one thing that the slave owners would do to make sure that their slaves would stay their slaves for the rest of the year is that during Christmas they would get them, I mean they would allow them to be licentious and drink 
alcohol and be pretty immoral. And throughout that week, the slaves would learn that um, that they uh, how do I want to say this? That freedom wasn't what they wanted because it was hurting them. Being drunk wasn't um, a good thing for them, so they decided they would not. Um, they wouldn't want to free themselves from that. And um, Douglas notices this because he had another opportunity to take a different ex uh, perspective, I would say, having been around a lot of different plantations, and specifically the one where he learned to read, he could tell the difference between um, having the knowledge and not having the knowledge for that. Um, yes. So, sorry. I, let, me, let me clarify so I can make sure I, I know what you're saying. So you're saying that the him reading, him being exposed to an education and being able to read books showed him that, it, that freedom wasn't what he had thought it was. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, in any other sense, does, so, hmm, hold on, let me frame my thoughts. <laughs> um, so in finally learning what the truth of freedom is, uh, that becomes his purpose or his meaning or the thing that's driving his actions. Is that the argument that you're making? Yes. Um, Yes. <laughs> All right. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're doing great. Um, and I think Madam Clara had a related question on the same idea before we move on to any other ideas. <clears throat> um, so we have two um, two people, Douglas and Franco, uh, who they, they react to our our events with a uh, strength, quite exceptional, and. Um, who do you, what, why do you think they were able to do that? Do you think they are like extra, extraordinary? Or, or what makes them different than maybe the other slaves? Maybe uh, uh, the other uh, people in the camps? What do you think about that? Um, my first impressions with Franco is that prior to being in the concentration camps. <clears throat> he was a psychologist and a doctor, and so he was able to study the human mind and how it um, reacts to things and how it, how it works. And so when he was in the camp, he uses the word detachment, that he was able to kind of detach himself from the experience a little and um, I guess understand what was happening around him, not accepting it, but understanding that it was a situation and it wasn't what was going to break him. I think for Frederick Douglass, um, I think it's a little hard to say. He had a pretty extraordinary experience being. Um, put into a house where he was able to read. He definitely calls that providence and that it was, I don't know, by chance or if by fate, but it was spe specific to him that he was able to learn. And, and so I think that's what makes them extraordinary, as well as having the passion to continue to fight back and not accept what was happening around them. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit, in light of what you just said, about this scientific detachment that Frankel says he has. Yes. And if you could talk about what you think the difference is between that and this stage of apathy that all the prisoners go through. Yes. Sorry. I'm going to take a look at this. So, his specific quote, it says, to attempt a methodical presentation of the subject is very difficult. Now, psychology requires a certain scientific detachment. 
Um, that's a callback to when he was a psychologist trying to understand the presentation, he says, of this subject. Um, and so, um, this detachment, I would say, is different from the apathy or the desensitization because it's not, um, I would say, it's not necessarily a state of mind. Like desensitization and apathy, it's depressing uh, and oppressing and it weighs down and, and it kind of stops the brain from thinking and feeling the way it should. While this detachment is, I would, it's kind of like a scientific, like, hypothetical model where you can actively still think about what's happening around you, but it's not a part of you. So are you saying that for Frankl, he's constantly assessing the situation, but he's not part of it in the same way, and for the other prisoners, they've just shut down? Yes. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think he explained it's a way of survival. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, he called it like it was like the second step mm -hmm. or the third step in yeah, just in just becoming one of the prisoners. So on the topic of apathy, um, looking at both Frankel and Douglas. I could imagine either of them falling into a spectrum of becoming apathetic or swinging too far in the other direction and just completely ignoring their circumstances and having a, a Pollyanna view of the world of everything's going to be okay, everything's going to be okay, even if that is not at all reflected in their circumstances. Yet both of them are firmly grounded in their circumstances. They are not denying that they are, in Douglas's case, a slave, in Frankel's case, a prisoner, uh, yet they don't hit either of those two extremes. They don't become the happy-go-lucky Pollyanna, and they don't become the apathetic person who refuses to find any positive experience. Um, and I'd like to know how you think they managed to strike that balance. Um, or find a third middle road, or a third road that's completely unrelated to the other two, whatever visual you would like to use for that. Um, but how do they do that? <laughs> well, I would say starting with Frankel, he gives some ex um, experiences of men by the end who have been overcome by apathy in their lives, and they were... Um, unreasonably angry at things. They, deserve, they thought they deserved, um, I guess, some kind of... Uh, they deserved to act differently to men because of their own experience. And Frankl, um, he doesn't excuse them, but he says that no one, like, no one has the right to do what's wrong, even though they have been put in the circumstances that they have been so I think, for Frankl, he recognizes that there are two different sides to the spectrum. Number one, that there being apathy. Number two, there being, I guess like you call it the Pollyanna where everything's fine. And I think the reason he doesn't swing so far to that one side is because... He can recognize, I feel like, the evil that there is in the camps. He knows that it's not right and that it shouldn't ever have been right or a thing that ever happened. So he couldn't say that everything is fine or everything was fine or everything that will be fine because I think he has experienced the evil and the cruelty that the world has presented to him. I think for Douglas, there definitely was a point in his life 
when he felt apathetic to the world and he felt that he was being treated unjustly and he was being treated very poorly. But um, once he made it out, he realized that the people of the North were much different from the people of the South religion-wise, they were different moral-wise, and their morality made them happy and made them noble, and he wanted to be a part of that as well. But having experienced what he experienced, and knowing that there was still a problem with the slaves in the South, he decided um, that he would take a stand against it, he would join the abolitionists, not as an idealist, but trying to find a way to help the people around him and the people that he had cared for during his time in slavery. Um, when you're talking about Douglas, you said that he, um, he was apathetic at first. And then is it his education or is it his freedom that helps him fight that apathy? What do you think? I think he was apathetic during his time as a slave, but I think I think I would like it to be the education that really freed him because that proves that education for anybody would lead them somewhere higher than where they are, not just being freed. Because I think, I mentioned this a little in my panel, that um, Douglas couldn't just write everyone passes to freedom because it was his, his learning and his learning to read that made him really understand and value freedom. So, I'm going to push you on that a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Well, we do get one instance where Douglas decides to teach Sunday school to the slaves on the same plantation that he's on. And so he's definitely willing to educate them. But then I guess that begs the question, what side does more work if he could escape and work with the abolitionists? Would that do better things for the slaves? Or would educating them one by one and never really experiencing being his own free man bring, I guess, more freedom? I don't know. That's one of the questions I came up with, too. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of the, the chicken before the egg thing yeah. of does intellectual freedom lead to physical freedom, or does physical freedom lead to intellectual freedom, or is it different for each, each person? person? And Douglas might have experienced it one way. Uh, and maybe somebody else experienced it another way, because we do know that he did excellent work as mm -hmm. an abolitionist and working with other abolitionists. Um, so, hmm, you're giving me a lot to think about. <laughs> so I want to move on before I just <laughs> take over. Um, in both books, they, they mention uh, providence or fate. Do, how important do you think it is in, the, in those lives? Like, do you think uh, without that fate or providence, the life um, you see, or what did it help for them to get what they were? Um. Um. What I would have to say is, Douglas definitely mentions providence, and he mentions. Um, the help of, of God, and I think um, religion was definitely a big part in his life. He experienced the a lot of the negative sides to religion, especially with his slave owners, but knowing that, I think, for him, that there was someone watching out for him and someone guiding him along the way to freedom, I think that did help him 
as far as Frankel goes, I know he mentions um, belief in God and all that, but I am, I'm not so sure. Remember when he mentioned his story with the guy who rides a horse to he met the death? So yes. He rides a horse and he's going to meet Karen. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that story was brought up because uh, Franco learns that in the camp he was in before he moved camps, cannibalism had struck and he got out just in time. Um, I think in that instance he would have definitely believed in providence <coughs> because um, ex uh, what he experienced in the concentration camps was horrifying enough knowing that there was cannibalism going on as well would have been even worse I, I can imagine um, but with the story of death in Teheran I think it does show that he has some trust in Providence and that he made it out the way he did because he needed to be somewhere else and serve a different purpose. Because, yeah, you said uh, in the conclusion that uh, we need to learn by ourselves and for ourselves. Yeah. Um, so we have to be active in our lives, but there is also this part of fate. Everything we can combine with both. Everything with both people combine it in, in their place. Um I think um, both are very active in trying to get out of the situation for um, for Douglas, he knew there was a specific time when it wasn't r the right time for him to escape and that he had to plan it out specifically. And for Frankel, he definitely had to wait out in the camps until they were, fr all, all of the prisoners were freed. Um, but combining them, I guess, um, I don't really know if we could control this providence or this fate, but we can definitely work alongside it. That you both used it to their advantage, I would say, in in finding their own freedom. Yeah. I'm gonna flip you back to apathy. I'm stuck. Um, <laughs> so you've presented this. You can live actively and make choices. And then there's this passive apathy. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, particularly in Frankel, he, he mentioned several cases of prisoners who have some sort of hope and help others, and then they get gassed right away. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm just wondering what you do with that. So because at the end, in the second part of Frankel, he seems to also say that part of your choices has to involve some sort of morale. You, get, you don't get to choose these other things. It's not good. Um, so they've chosen this moral thing to help others and to, to try to avoid apathy, but it gets them to their death faster. I'm, so, I'm wondering what you do with that, because he also presents this side where apathy is necessary for a prisoner to, to keep you going in mm -hmm. any sort of way you have to detach somewhat. So um, is there an advantage to apathy? Is it worth it? I guess I would struggle to say yes, because I don't think apathy is a good thing to have ever. Just because, um, I don't know, just because it's going to keep you alive longer, I guess, in the camp. I don't know if I would ever, I don't know if I would say it's worth it. I would say for the people who decided to, um, 
to still be noble and still do the right thing, they would be gassed because of, I mean, other people's <laughs> wants and they wanted them to become apathetic. So if you decided to fight against the apathy completely and remain noble and moral, they would just, they would have to get rid of you. But I guess in some way, this might sound a little cruel, that is a kind of freedom because they're no longer in their situation. But they are remembered as noble people, which is, I think, that's, that's something. <laughs> but I, I don't think I could say apathy is worth it in any sort of long run. would say <clears throat> in in our lives speaking of what we get to experience now a purpose could be something like something that interests you like it could be a hobby is a kind of purpose um, finding purposes I suppose <laughs> that's a pretty hard question. I think being active and being moral, I think you find purpose in just doing little things every day. <laughs> and I guess you could have one purpose for life, and that's it. But, I mean, I don't think there's one specifically for one person, and that's their only purpose. I think you can choose to have as many purposes as you like and how many meanings you like. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Let me think of you that one. Bit, um, maybe just a little yeah. bit, sure. So, life is absurd, but in a way, we should face it, accept it uh, as the truth. But it doesn't mean uh, that you, you are not active, that you need still to revolt just for your own dignity, in a way, um, build a life even though it's meaningless. Yes. <clears throat> because 
title is? The Search for Me. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Do you think Franco will be agree with Kevin? I, <laughs> I think the idea of activity would definitely agree with that, but simply doing that to challenge um, to challenge life, I'm not so sure. I think that Frankel would say that we should enjoy living and enjoy life because of its goodness and because of its beauty and if the um, if the absurdism is that life has no meaning and that like you said art and religion and things that we all find beautiful are are just illusions then I couldn't see the compatibility in that but the fighting against that I could definitely see. <laughs> so I still I have uh, still have time for this question. Uh, so we have the character of Nosso. Yeah. <laughs> and she's kind of an anti hero. Uh, how would you compare that character is um, because um, just to remind everybody, he's a uh, he's a guy who uh, just think uh, like in the US, he just lives his life day by day and he's kind of happy like that. <laughs> but uh, he doesn't really love anybody and, and he can kill someone and feel absolutely no guilt. So he's not violent but at the same time he has no moral uh, and he's not happy, he's a passive character in the whole mm. life. And he's condemned to death yeah. because he killed somebody. <laughs> what do you think about when you compare this character uh, with Franco or the rest. What are you struggling with? Because I know you struggle with it. <laughs> I did. I did struggle with more so. I think because I think it definitely did have to do part with the absurdism and I just did not understand <laughs> that very much. But comparing more so to either of the characters, um, people, sorry, uh, Frankel or Douglas, both of them love extreme, like, they extremely love um, the people they surround themselves with, uh, their, um, their wives, both of them definitely feel a lot of love for their wives. Um, and actually in Frankel's case, it's what really keeps him going is the idea that he still has someone that he can wait for one of the quotes, I'm not going to remember it exactly, but is that if someone has, someone that they're responsible for, that they will keep them going. Um, I think, morality-wise, I couldn't quite understand more so, because he, like you said, he could kill a person and not feel any guilt for it. But um, I couldn't imagine either Douglas or Frankel, even taking a life because it would, it would add to the evil and the apathy of the world. Yes. Can you, this is hard, I'm not sure if I can do that, <laughs> but um, can you unpack the, the love part a little bit more? So it's one of the three ways that Frankel says someone can find meaning, mm -hmm. um, and in that in those moments that he's thinking about his wife, there, there are a couple of moments in the text where he also pretty much says, she's probably dead. But there's something about the love that still creates meaning, even though she's probably not waiting for him. Any ideas of what's going on there? Like I said, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I found the quote. It says, a man who becomes conscious of the responsibility he bears toward a, towards a human being who affectionately waits for him, or to an unfinished work, will never be able to throw away his life. And you bring up that maybe she's not waiting for him, maybe she is actually dead, because it's, it could be a possibility they haven't seen each other in a long time. I think um, going along with love, um, that being beauty, Frankel describes one experience where 
he sees, I think it, it just recently rained in the camps, and he can see the sky reflecting in the puddles, and he says, wow, the world could be so beautiful. And that beauty reminds him of his wife. And um, I think even just having the possibility that she would be there waiting for him and for any of the other men, because the other men do, Frankel does admit that they do think of their wives, um, gave him like the feelings to overcome apathy, even just for that moment in time. Yeah. So is the role of beauty to remind him of love? I think, I think yes. I think the beauty does remind of, does recall the evil to love. Yeah. He says that more and more I thought I was able to touch her, able to stretch out my hand and grasp hers. And that was after his experience seeing just the beauty of nature in itself. Um, I think... If you connect love and beauty in your mind, one will recall the other. Um, I don't have anything to back up that with Frederick Douglass, but <laughs> but I, I like yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah. Would you say that there's any suffering that is too great for this process? I mean. I can't think of a whole lot of suffering that goes beyond what happens on a slave plantation and what go happens on within a concentration camp. But do you think there's anything that either will not fit into this paradigm of trying to find meaning as a way to push through what is difficult or uh, endure? Uh, yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, okay. I can understand that. I actually, when I was reading through my notes today in my book, I found this really cool passage that I wish I had included in my thesis, but I didn't. He says, um, uh, right here on page 44, to draw an analogy, a man's suffering is similar to the behavior of gas. If a certain quantity of gas is pumped into an empty chamber, it will fill the chamber completely and evenly, no matter how big the chamber. The suffering fills the human soul and conscious mind, no matter whether the suffering is great or little. Therefore, the size of human suffering is absolutely relative. And I mean, that's kind of a sad example to bring up gas chambers, but, um, <laughs> sorry. Um, but that no matter how much suffering a person has, it still all has to fit within one body or within one um, chamber. And so a small suffering still fills up a human as much as a great amount of suffering. And I would think, and I would agree with Frankel, that no amount of, of suffering could, um, like the amount doesn't matter. It's, it's suffering is always going to happen but that all that suffering can be overcome. Just because um, I think, um, how do I say this? I'm not very good with analogies, but a human is able to overcome a little suffering in their, in their self. A human should be able to also be, uh, should be able to overcome a large amount of suffering if if that's what I guess if that's what their purpose is is to continue to live or not to continue to, yeah I'm getting all jumbled up now but um, if they want to live then they will overcome the suffering <laughs> yes, and it's hard to say because we don't want to put people in 
situations, so they suffer, so they learn. But if we know that suffering is going to happen in life and we accept that when suffering comes, I feel like we can find the meaning in it because we know that there is a time when there is not going to be suffering. And so, how would I restate that? I think knowing, okay, I'll say it one more time, knowing <laughs> that you will suffer, you can also know that there is a time when the suffering will end. And that hope is what can keep you and find you, find meaning. Yeah. Keep you going and help you find meaning. <laughs> is it just the hope that the suffering ends or is it a hope that something other yeah. suffering? Yeah. It's something after suffering. It's the hope that I think the hope I would even say the belief that there's goodness and beauty in the world, even amidst the suffering. That time. That's my panel. <laughs> that's my thesis. That's my thesis. <laughs> Despite the evil in the world, there is beauty and purpose and hope in that. So is that the choice in the moment? I'm trying to figure out how choice plays in. Is it the choice to determine that there's still beauty? Is it the choice to have a good attitude? Is it the choice to do something about it? What's the choice? Um, I think the choice, at least the first choice you have to make, is... Hmm. I think the first choice you have to make is to be active, and then things will follow from that. Because if you're active, then I guess then you're just you're not. I mean that makes sense. If you're active, you're not passive. You won't be waiting for things. You'll be actively looking for things, even if you don't know what they are quite yet. And so, the first choice you have to make is to act. I think. Act in a particular direction, act, I brush my teeth. <laughs> What's the action? <laughs> um, I, would, I recognize it can be different, yeah. different situations, <laughs> but what kinds of actions are you thinking? Um, definitely moral actions. And I think. I don't know exactly, but actions that are going to take you outside of yourself and not just focus only on yourself. Like, maybe you choose, like, the people who are guests in the camps to give up your bread to someone else. And so you starve, but someone else gets to have enough food for the day. I have one more question, and then I think we'll have some time for questions for the audience, if anyone has any. Um, on page 16 of your thesis, you talk about how the people in the concentration camps draw into themselves. Mm -hmm. Why is that a bad thing? Already. Yeah. Wrong page. Okay. So, drawing into yourself. Um, so, it brings up that when a person would draw into themselves, that um, they might, I think, that they might forget about what's happening around them necessarily. They might, okay, this, it, 
I wish I could cite all these examples because there's, I'm just going to bring up a ton of examples. Um, but watching, let's say, one example I would bring up, watching the dead men get um, taken out of the hospitals, they would just drag the body and Frankel describes that you could hear the head falling down on every single step all the way down the stairs and him not reacting to that and not caring that that body was being disrespected and mistreated um, and so drawing into yourself you forget I feel like that other people are suffering and it's not necessarily our job to uh, I mean the other people should find that's a hard example because that person is dead. But um, I think it's just the empathy that you you lose when you only think of yourself. And when you draw into yourself, you are not going to be thinking about others. Mm-hmm. He at least knows that it's wrong, but he isn't feeling empathy. Yeah. At the moment. <laughs> so yeah. He's aware of something. Yeah. Yeah. So he's kind of a yeah. detached. Mm-hmm. He has like, yeah, two perceptions of the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> Does anyone in the audience have any questions for Ms. Staples? Yes. Uh, I have a lot of questions because I didn't catch them into your, your thesis. <laughs> Um, I'm going to give you a choose your own adventure. Oh, <laughs> yay. So, so listen carefully. I have uh, more than two, but I'll do two. So you can answer Brother Skaramazov question, oh. or a question uh, more specifically about uh, what the search for meaning is. Which one would you like? <laughs> um, I think I'll go with Karamazov. I, I suspected you would. Okay. <laughs> Um, Sounds interesting. So you just wrote an essay on those yes. famous three chapters in the Brothers Karamazov. Yes. Right, where Alyosha and Ivan are talking. And uh, I'm wondering what you, if you thought about your thesis at all as you read Ivan's take on suffering in the world. Because he doesn't reject that there is this light, although he puts it in the future in this eternal harmony. Mm-hmm. But he's, his position seems to be it's not really worth it. That nothing is worth it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was wondering how you would compare or contrast uh, what you've taken away from these two authors with what Yvonne says about suffering and the future harmony. Okay. <sighs> okay, he definitely brings up that, um, specifically for children, that the suffering of children is not worth um, the eternal harmony that everyone would get, whether or not they deserve it because um, of, because everyone suffers together, and so everyone would, in, in this final stage of the world, that everyone would I'm not, I, I'm going to misremember, but um, that everyone would be somehow forgiven of their sins and li- be able to live in that eternal harmony. And, um, okay, so now that I have that in my mind. Um, and that's exactly right. Okay. That is? Okay. What I would say is, um, I don't think I don't think either 
Douglas or Franco would, I don't know if they would bring worth into it because, I mean, does Ivan, does Ivan know that men must suffer? Does he know that that's going to happen no matter what? Because if he believes that suffering is going to happen no matter what, I don't know how he would, um, how that would necessarily go with, like, even just living if, if, if everyone would have to suffer, then it doesn't make sense that he's, I don't know, that he's upset that children must suffer as well. That's a, that's a hard question. <laughs>